billions of years into the future, the remnants of a once great civilization find refuge in the shadows. During their heyday, their engineers spanned entire star systems, converting planets and asteroids into a colossal interstellar empire. However, in the twilight of their existence, all that grandeur has vanished. The universe surrounding them is in its final throes as the last stars flicker out. Across endless ages, the once vibrant sky fades into an everlasting night, the aging cosmos succumbing to desolation and decay. In this darkness, they await the inevitable end. Long before the decline became evident, they foresaw the universe's irreversible trajectory. Systematically seeking a final haven to endure eternity, they undertook their ultimate engineering feat. Around a forsaken black hole, they erected a new sanctuary. Using disassembled worlds as raw materials, they crafted a protective shell to encase the darkness. Within this fragile enclosure, barely resisting the gravitational pull of their savior, they eked out their modest existence. The waning light from dying stars showered their ultimate home, while the swirling black hole fueled their survival. Yet, the black hole at their core bestowed upon them the greatest gift, time. The identity of the scientist who first grasped the nature of time was lost to memory, but the astro-engineers understood that time unfolded differently across the cosmos. Within the immense gravity of the black hole, time flowed more languidly. While countless years passed in the outer realms, mere moments transpired within the colossal sphere. Thus, the remnants of the civilization observed the unfolding future before them, knowing that they had only postponed, not avoided, their ultimate demise. Inevitably, the darkness would envelop them for all eternity. Over a hundred years ago, Einstein turned our understanding of time and space upside down with his relativity theories. But have you ever wondered how it really works? Time and space seem like everyday concepts, right? But beneath their familiar surface, there are loads of mysteries we're still figuring out. What is space, really? As our world kept spinning, its heartbeat started messing with the very fabric of the universe. We've tried everything to keep going, but the inevitable keeps looming. We can bend reality, but breaking it? That's a tough nut to crack. Einstein once said, Behind it all is surely an idea so simple, so beautiful, that when we grasp it, we'll wonder why we didn't get it sooner. The big question remains, what is space? As kids, we learn to navigate our world in three dimensions, up, down, left, right, back and front. But what's the deal with this universal stage where our lives play out? Early philosophers like Plato had their own takes calling space the nurse of becoming. It's like this medium where everything exists, but without its own qualities, according to him and his student Aristotle. Over 2,000 years had passed before humanity conceptualized space. By the 17th century, modern science was taking shape, crystallizing our understanding of the universe into physical laws. The transition from myths to mathematical language marked a significant evolution Isaac Newton played a pivotal role in this scientific revolution, but to set the stage, let's begin with a boat. In 1632, Galileo, in his mid-sixties, and having faced scrutiny from the Roman Inquisition for asserting that the Earth orbited the Sun, decided to focus on consolidating his ideas. He quietly compiled his thoughts on space and the cosmos into a groundbreaking work, Dialogue Concerning the Two Chief World Systems. In this influential book, Galileo reflects on the life of a sailor, particularly one confined below deck in a windowless cabin amidst plates, knives, and a goldfish in a bowl. The sailor's experience varied. In a calm port, the cabin exuded serenity with a content goldfish and undisturbed tableware. Yet when faced with rough seas, chaos ensued. The ship's movement disrupted the cabin, causing plates and cutlery to scatter and water to spill from the goldfish bowl. On tranquil seas with billowing sails, the ship accelerated, noticeable to the sailor as items slid off the table. 
However, when the wind subsided, the ship glided smoothly on a glassy sea. Inside the cabin, calmness returned, giving the illusion of stillness as if the ship were docked. A dropped plate fell straight to the floor and the sailor could sit comfortably in their chair. It was in these moments that Galileo had a realization. Lacking a vantage point to unveil the truth, the sailor found himself unable to conduct experiments that could determine whether the ship was in motion or at rest. His deduction led him to reject the idea of an absolute state of rest in space. According to him, any smooth and constant motion should be perceived uniformly by everyone, akin to a state of stillness. Galileo, therefore, asserted that any uniform motion is purely relative to another uniform motion, marking the birth of the first theory of relativity. Imagine Galileo's sailor peacefully sailing on the seas near the Earth's equator, rotating at 1,600 kilometers per h around the Earth, which itself orbits the sun at 67,000 kilometers per h. This sun, in turn, travels around the Milky Way at a speed of 720,000 kilometers per h, and the Milky Way is on a journey toward the Andromeda galaxy at 403,000 kilometers per h. Astonishingly, throughout this vast journey spanning millions of kilometers from the starting point, the sailor perceives no sensation of movement. Regrettably, when Galileo published his findings, he once again clashed with the Catholic Church. The heliocentric perspective he championed resulted in his conviction for heresy. His work faced a ban, remaining on the Church's index of forbidden books, until 1835. In the subsequent decades, two of Europe's brilliant minds engaged in a heated debate about the nature of space. One, Isaac Newton, born in England in 1642, nearly a year after Galileo's death, is celebrated as one of the greatest thinkers in history. On the other side of the argument was Gottfried Leibniz, less known today but a formidable intellectual of his time. Born in 1646 in what we now call Germany, he was a prominent intellectual of his time, delving into the realms of mathematics and philosophy. He contemplated profound metaphysical inquiries, one of which continues to perplex physicists and philosophers today. Why is there something rather than nothing? The feud between these two individuals sparked during the development of calculus. Even though Leibniz published his work first, Newton accused him of stealing ideas. As the president of the Royal Society at the time, Newton initiated a committee to investigate the dispute, and unsurprisingly, the committee sided with Newton. This animosity spilled over into their second disagreement, the fate of a spinning bucket of water. Newton asserted that space was an absolute, universal stage on which motion played out. According to him, even in a universe devoid of matter to perceive any motion, both space and motion would exist. To illustrate his point, Newton presented the scenario of a stationary bucket of water with a flat surface. When the bucket spins, the water also spins, causing its surface to curve. Newton questioned, what is the water spinning with respect to? He argued that the acceleration of the spin was relative to an absolute space, separate from the object itself. Contrastingly, Leibniz found the concept of space in an empty universe nonsensical. He believed that the properties of objects were essential in defining their meaning. According to Leibniz, space only gained meaning in relation to the positions of objects, and time only held significance when discussing the relative motions of objects. Without matter, Leibniz contended, space and time had no role and, consequently, no existence. Sadly, Leibniz passed away in 1716 with the argument still ongoing, but Newton's ideas prevailed. The concept of absolute space and time became the accepted scientific view for nearly two centuries, with the exception of Galileo's rejection of absolute rest. Although absolute space emerged victorious in the debate, absolute rest, a fixed point, remained an impossibility. The idea of relativity continued to be part of the ongoing discourse. However, this concept primarily applied to space. Time, on the other hand, presented a different scenario. 
with its inherent direction, time seemed distinct. According to Newton and Galileo, every clock across the universe ticked with absolute synchronicity, a universal beat that resonated through every cosmic event. A second on Earth was considered the same as a second everywhere else. But was this truly the case? Is time flexible, or is it an unwavering metronome propelling the cosmos forward? Does time possess inherent properties, or is it defined solely by the events occurring within its current? To unravel these questions, we must not start with physicists pondering clocks, rulers, and motion, but rather with an exploration of heat. What is time? In a future universe far away, our civilization faces its twilight near an aging black hole. Bound by the inevitability of their demise, they can only sit and wait. In this cosmic theater, where stars fade into memories, the currency of raw energy has become paramount. To safeguard what little remains, they've embraced a decelerated existence, each facet dedicated to survival. As their weary eyes gaze upon the increasingly darkened skies, the encroaching heat death of the universe forces them to confront time as their ultimate adversary. Consider this. Witnessing a cup of tea tumble off a table Shattering on the floor is a common sight. Yet, the spectacle of that same cup miraculously reassembling itself and returning to the table is an impossibility. This prompts a fundamental question. What is time? Much like space, ancient thinkers grappled with the nature of time. Aristotle, in ancient Greece, simplified it as the interval between before and after while Hindu philosophers envision time as a cyclical journey spanning four billion years from creation to destruction. Despite these ponderings, the true essence of time remained elusive. Unlike space, time isn't an apparent constant. It's a peculiar phenomenon that eludes our control. We cannot traverse time as freely as we do space. Time possesses a distinct chronology, a discernible past, and an approaching future. While scientists pragmatically use clocks as tools, much like rulers, in their experiments, the nature of time beckons deeper consideration. To unravel its mysteries, we're led to contemplate horses and steam engines. Just as space holds secrets, time proves to be a different enigma, inviting us to ponder its essence beyond the ticking of a clock. The advent of the Industrial Revolution posed a challenge for humanity. Traditional sources of power, like horses and cattle, were straightforward to manage. Knowing how much to feed them and how hard to work them was simple. A specific amount of hay could ensure a day's labor from a well-fed animal. However, with the arrival of innovative machines like steam engines, a new dilemma emerged. How do you quantify the productivity of a pile of coal in comparison to a horse's feed? This question held economic significance. Should one replace a horse with an engine if the cost of feeding the engine exceeds that of the horse? It was in grappling with this dilemma that the field of thermodynamics was born. Numerous thinkers pondered the ultimate efficiency of engines. During the early days of thermodynamics, Typical engines operated at a mere 3% efficiency. In a physical steam engine, the heat from the fire is utilized to boil water, yet some of that heat dissipates into the air. Additionally, there are energy losses due to the friction of metal against metal, creating both noise and heat, forms of energy loss. In any physical steam engine, these heat losses as waste were unavoidable. The realm of thermodynamics, through its mathematical investigations, revealed that perfect efficiency is an unattainable ideal. Energy is invariably lost as heat transfers from one point to another. The potent energy released by burning coal must undergo degradation as it traverses through the engine, with some inevitably lost to the surroundings. Consequently, a new parameter was introduced to account for this increase in decay and disorder. Entropy. The manner in which this occurs is governed by probability. In the words of physicist George Gamo from the early 20th century, consider the room you're in right now. 
Just like the air fills the room uniformly, it's highly unlikely that the air would suddenly gather in one corner, making you suffocate. Although not physically impossible, the odds are trillions upon trillions of times longer than the age of the universe. Disorder is statistically more probable. Modern physicists, through the new laws of thermodynamics, have unveiled an inevitable increase in entropy as the universe progresses, a future where disorder and decay surpass today's state. Not just steam engines, but entire celestial bodies, planets, stars, galaxies, and filaments, all moving from order to disorder. In 1862, Lord Kelvin, for whom the unit of temperature is named, predicted the grim outcome. There is a universal tendency to energy's dissipation, which produces exhaustion of potential energy through the material universe. If the universe is finite and follows existing laws, it would eventually reach a state of universal rest and death. So, is this the narrative of our time? A universe continually dying, heading towards an unavoidable heat death? Stars extinguishing one by one, progressing from potential energy to waste, leaving a dark and spent universe after trillions of years. One of the brilliant minds contemplating entropy and the arrow of time was James Clerk Maxwell, the iconic Scottish scientist from the 19th century. His insights into thermodynamics shaped our comprehension of heat and gases, all with the assistance of a demon. Maxwell grasped the significance of entropy. He understood that when you blend two gases, one hot and one cold, the outcome is a warm gas. Moreover, he recognized that this gas would remain warm and mixed, defying the expectation of separating into distinct hot and cold halves. Yet he pondered, what if we introduced a tiny creature, a demon capable of sensing each atom in the gas? This demon could manipulate the atoms, directing slower ones to one side and faster ones to the other. Since a gas's temperature reflects the average speed of its atoms, the demon effectively divided the warm gas into two uneven halves, one hot and the other cold. This demon appeared to defy the laws of thermodynamics. It transformed the disordered state of warm gas into a more ordered state of hot and cold gas. Despite being a mere thought experiment, debates about the meaning of Maxwell's demon have persisted for over 150 years. Some argue that the demon must expend energy to sort the gas atoms, leading to a continual rise in total entropy. However, others suggest that it's not energy, but the use of information, specifically the speeds of the atoms, that matters in this process. Connecting energy, entropy, and information might seem unconventional. Nevertheless, in the past three quarters of a century, this connection has grown increasingly apparent. As anyone familiar with computers can attest, processing information generates a substantial amount of waste heat. However, the situation is more intricate. It's not merely the information processing that results in waste heat, but also the forgetting of information. When we combine three and two, we get the straightforward answer of five. However, if I were to present the answer as five and then ask which two numbers were added together, it becomes an unsolvable puzzle. In the realm of computers, logic gates come into play, merging electronic signals to perform addition. Once two numbers are input, they are essentially erased as a single answer is produced. This process is irreversible, with the initial inputs lost in the void. Interestingly, during this forgetting process, the logic gates experience a slight increase in temperature. This phenomenon leads us to the ultimate limit of forgetting, known as the Landauer limit. It represents the unavoidable release of energy when erasing a single bit of information and, at room temperature, amounts to just over one hundredth of an electron volt. Experimentally validated in 2012, scientists predict that current computer chips generate thousands of times more heat than this limit, but by 2035, they are likely to reach it. This minute amount of waste heat will inevitably contribute to the entropy of the universe. Across the cosmos, it is the irreversibility of calculations that propels the increase in entropy. Forgetting information becomes a crucial factor in establishing the arrow of time. 
Does this imply that the significance of yesterday and tomorrow hinges on our ability to forget? Is the existence of the future intricately linked to our incapacity to remember? Now, we circle back to our solitary civilization, teetering on the edge of universal heat death in the distant future. When all usable energy is depleted and entropy reaches its maximum, does time retain any meaning? While fundamental physics lacks a definitive answer, the concept is intriguing. Yet, we stand at a turning point. The foundations of time and space can only take us so far, and amidst their usefulness, a revolution is on the horizon. A new order is emerging, promising to usher us directly to the final days of our solitary black hole world. As we progress on our journey, we must delve into new dimensions of time and space. New Space Within the protective shell of their black hole, many civilizations resigned themselves to their inevitable fate, peacefully dozing their way toward the end. However, a handful of inquisitive minds, fueled by their diminishing energy, continued to ponder the mysteries of the universe. Ancient books, with a history spanning nearly eternity, recounted tales of how space could bend and ripple. At the heart of these narratives lay the story of light. They understood the immense speed of light and had utilized it to measure the vastness of their empire. Despite their relentless efforts, they recognized that the speed of light represented an unbreakable limit. This universal constant marked the initial stride in their enduring quest to unravel the secrets of the cosmos. On a summer night, when you step outside and gaze toward the zenith, the brightest star in the northern skies, Vega of the Lyre, will be shining almost directly above you. It lies 26 light years away, a distance perilously close to the point of no return for us ephemeral beings. Beyond Vega, no one can ever journey homeward to reunite with those cherished on Earth. The enigma surrounding the speed of light has persisted through the ages. Early experiments involving the exchange of flashing lights had suggested a speed far surpassing that of sound. This led scientists to ponder whether its velocity was infinite. The year 1676 brought the long-awaited answer, courtesy of Danish astronomer Ole Romer. While observing Jupiter's moons in their orbits around the gas giant, Romer precisely timed their entry into the planetary shadow. Assuming their orbits operated like clockwork, he anticipated being able to predict the onset and conclusion of the moon's eclipses. As he observed Jupiter's moon, Io, throughout the year, his predictions about its movements went through ups and downs. It became apparent that the accuracy of his predictions depended on our distance from Jupiter. To refine his calculations, he realized he needed to account for the extra time it took light to travel a greater distance. Using Romer's data, fellow astronomer Christian Huygens calculated that light must travel at more than 211,000 kilometers per second, which is close to our modern estimate of about 300,000 kilometers per second. Romer's observations confirmed that light was both fast and finite. However, the true nature of light remained a mystery for two more centuries. James Clerk Maxwell, known for his work on electromagnetism, proposed that light was a self-propagating combination of electricity and magnetism. Despite this breakthrough, a crucial question remained. What was the speed of light relative to? Maxwell's equations didn't provide a clear answer, prompting physicists to explore different possibilities. One hypothesis was that light traveled through an invisible medium, a mysterious ether permeating the cosmos. However, this idea raised concerns as it implied a universal state of rest, contradicting Galileo's principle of relativity. Faced with this dilemma, some physicists set out to measure the properties of the supposed ether, while others dared to make a bolder leap based on the evidence before them. One of the key figures in the latter group was a young Albert Einstein. Einstein pondered over the curious fact that electricity and magnetism did not conform to Galileo's theory of relativity. Why, he wondered, 
Should experiments involving the flow of electricity or the spin of a magnet reveal absolute motion? Taking a bold leap, he asserted that they simply couldn't, and thus the special theory of relativity was born. In his imaginative scenario aboard Galileo's ship, Einstein proposed that all experiments would yield identical results, whether the ship was anchored in port or smoothly sailing on a calm sea. Tossing a ball wouldn't indicate the ship's motion, and surprisingly, even measuring the speed of light wouldn't either. Einstein's groundbreaking revelation was that the speed of light in a vacuum remained constant, regardless of its source. This statement contradicted Newtonian mechanics, where speeds could be added together, and each observer would measure different speeds based on their own motion. However, according to Einstein, this did not apply to light. Everyone would measure the same speed, whether the ship was stationary, cruising at 50 knots, or blazing at 50,000. Yet if this were true, something else had to give. The only variables left were the very nature of space and time. For the theory to hold, each observer needed their own measurement of space and time. Special relativity dictated that the speed of light was absolute, not space and time. No longer were space and time the universal stage on which physics unfolded. Just as Maxwell had unified electricity and magnetism, the stage was set for space-time to become the next unified concept. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to share with you a groundbreaking perspective on space and time. Brace yourselves as the conventional notions of space and time as separate entities are on the verge of becoming mere shadows. The key lies in their fusion, a union that will sustain an independent reality. Back in 1908, Hermann Minkowski, Einstein's former professor, proposed a revolutionary idea. Fueled by the insights of special relativity in 1905, he delved into the geometry of these novel equations. Unlike Einstein, who treated space and time as distinct entities, Minkowski advocated for a more straightforward approach, combining them into what he called space-time. This melding, facilitating the transformation of an observer's viewpoint through geometry, gave birth to the concept of combined space-time. This amalgamation of three spatial dimensions and one temporal dimension is now famously known as Minkowski space, a term coined in honor of Minkowski himself, who unfortunately passed away in 1909 before his idea gained full acceptance in the physics community. The traditional understanding of Newtonian space and time was completely overturned, yet Einstein wasn't entirely satisfied. Despite Einstein's groundbreaking contributions that reshaped our understanding of space and time, a significant puzzle remained. Gravity. Newton's gravitational equations, reliant on distances between masses, faced a challenge. Special relativity introduced the notion that observers couldn't even agree on these distances. The quest for a comprehensive understanding continued. So he went back to square one and spent a decade pondering gravity. What emerged from his thoughts in 1915 was a groundbreaking solution that revolutionized physics. Einstein took Minkowski's spatial temporal framework and transformed both space and time into flexible entities, bending and stretching in the presence of mass and energy, resulting in curvature. In his general theory, Einstein boldly asserted that gravity, as a force, was non-existent. Instead, its effects were embedded in the curvature of space and time. Newton's traditional concept of space and time was unequivocally debunked. Not only were space and time relative, but they were also malleable. Einstein's theory of relativity had profound implications. In the special theory, the rate at which clocks ticked depended on motion, challenging the notion of a universal clock. With the advent of the general theory, the influence of location on the passage of time became even more apparent. Mass not only curved space, but also time, allowing gravity to determine the relative ticking of a clock. In 1916, Carl Schwarzschild cracked the relativity field equations for a spherical mass, unwittingly unveiling the mathematical groundwork for what would later be known as a black hole, though the term wouldn't be coined for another 50 years. 
Schwarzschild's solution demonstrated that black holes warped both space and time, creating powerful gravitational forces that even light couldn't escape. In the proximity of a black hole, where gravitational fields are immensely strong, time becomes increasingly distorted as you approach the center. In contrast to clocks in the distant universe, time ticks very slowly near the heart of darkness. Not only did the new equations give rise to black holes, but in the century following Einstein's groundbreaking insights into gravity, numerous other peculiar solutions emerged. Within the realm of relativistic literature, concepts such as wormholes, warp drives, and entire curved universes unfolded, all stemming from the flexible nature of space and time. In 1919, Einstein's theory gained validation when observations of starlight deflection elevated him to scientific superstar status. Consequently, scientists directed their focus toward precisely measuring the effects of general relativity to solidify the concept further. One particularly unusual experiment unfolded in 1971, conducted by Joseph Haffel and Richard Keating. Armed with a series of precise cesium clocks and a set of jet plane journeys circumnavigating the Earth, they aimed to delve into the intricacies of time dilation. At the experiment's outset, all clocks were synchronized at the same location. Some clocks embarked on eastward flights, while others ventured westward, some moving with Earth's rotation and others against it. A considerable sum of dollar 7,600 was invested in flights, with two seats on each plane reserved for the peculiar passenger named Mr. Clock. Due to the flights, these airborne clocks experienced a different gravitational field than those left behind on the ground. After circling the globe twice, all clocks were brought together. According to Newton's absolute time, they should have remained perfectly synchronized. However, if Einstein's theories held true, relative motions and space-time curvature would have caused a discrepancy. The experiment ran its course, and when the clocks were reunited, they showed a variance of a few hundred nanoseconds. Einstein emerged victorious in the competition between his theories and Newton's absolute time. However, there's another fascinating test of relativity that stands out. While developing the theory of relativity, Einstein observed that space-time, which can stretch and warp, exhibits a remarkable phenomenon. It can wobble and ring. Similar to Maxwell's discovery of ripples in electricity and magnetism, gravity too could have its own waves. However, Einstein found himself in a dilemma, uncertain whether his mathematical formulations were accurate or if he was deceiving himself. The question of whether these gravitational waves were a tangible aspect of reality perplexed him. Fast forward to 1974, when a young astronomy student named Russell Hulse made a groundbreaking discovery. Collaborating with his supervisor, Joseph Taylor, they observed the universe through the lens of the 300M Arecibo telescope. What they found was a pulsar, the rapidly spinning remnants of a deceased star emitting radio waves. This particular pulsar, known as PSRB 1913 plus 16, was spinning at an impressive rate of 17 times per second and was not alone. It was in orbit around another deceased star, a neutron star. By closely monitoring the regular pulses of the pulsar, they were able to meticulously map out this cosmic dance. However, the results were unexpected. According to Newtonian gravity, these lifeless stars should have orbited each other indefinitely. To Taylor and Hulse's surprise, they discovered that the orbits were gradually shrinking and the stars were slowly but consistently drawing closer. The energy of their orbits seemed to be dissipating into the universe. Taylor and Hulse considered Einstein's gravitational waves as a plausible explanation. They delved into the intricacies of general relativity, calculating how the orbiting stars generate ripples in space-time. This explained how precisely enough energy is carried away by these ripples to account for the diminishing orbits. In 1993, Taylor and Hulse were awarded the Nobel Prize for their groundbreaking discovery. 24 years later, the Nobel Prize was bestowed upon those who directly detected gravitational waves, validating Einstein's theoretical predictions.
The experiment in question was the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, abbreviated as LIGO. With an unprecedented level of sensitivity, LIGO can detect the subtle ripples in space-time. This groundbreaking observatory has provided a new and captivating perspective on the cosmos, unveiling phenomena like the merging of black holes and collisions between neutron stars. Astronomers are now setting their sights on tracing the origins of the oldest gravitational waves formed during the universe's birth. In this era shaped by Einstein's insights, it becomes evident that the language of the cosmos is written in the intricacies of gravity, manifesting as curved and warped space and time. However, amidst these revelations, there was an additional mystery embedded in the equations. Initially proposed by Alexander Friedman in 1922 and later confirmed by Edwin Hubble, the universe's expansion signifies the stretching of space itself, originating from an infinitely compact point 13.8 billion years ago, now known as the Big Bang. In simpler terms, there was less space in the past and there will be more space in the future. Galaxies, except for those in our local group, are gradually moving away from us at an average rate of 70 KLE slash SE slash MPC. This means that for every 3.26 million light years, a galaxy is distant from us. It is receding at an additional 70 km slash S slash MPC. Consequently, a galaxy situated 326 million light years away is moving at 7,000 kilometers per S, while one positioned 32.6 billion light years away is receding from us faster than the speed of light. Although this might seem perplexing given our existing knowledge, it's crucial to recognize that the universe's speed limit pertains to objects moving through space. In the case of these galaxies, space itself is expanding, creating more distance between them. The expansion of the universe introduces added complexity to the comprehension of curved and warped space-time. The equations imply that space is infinite, but what's truly happening is a decrease in the universe's density. Notably, this decrease in density is not uniform throughout the universe. As an individual, for instance, you are not gradually drifting away in this expansive cosmic dance. Individual galaxies maintain cohesion through the force of their mutual gravity. However, this gravitational force is a reflection of the curvature of space. This raises questions about what transpires at the border between expanding and non-expanding space. The challenge doesn't end there. The expansion of space alters the structure of yesterday's space-time compared to tomorrow's space-time, challenging the long-standing assumption of the conservation of energy in the universe. The significance of symmetry in physics, eloquently explained by mathematician Emmy Noether, revolves around the idea that a change in your situation shouldn't alter the underlying physics. This principle ensures that physics remains the same when you change your location, preserving the conservation of momentum. However, in an expanding universe where space-time undergoes changes, this symmetry is disrupted. Contrary to common intuition as space expands, it doesn't stretch or dilute, it simply increases in quantity. Nevertheless, in the vast expanse of an expanding universe, photons experience stretching, losing energy along the way. Galaxies also lose speed as their motion slows down. The growth of the cosmos disrupts the conservation of energy, posing a perplexing challenge for physicists. It might appear that space has now acquired tangible qualities, bending, expanding, curving, and rippling. Yet, there's one last revelation to consider. Nobel laureate Steven Weinberg encapsulates it well. In Einstein's relativity, space-time is essentially nothing. Despite the mathematical appearances of bending and curving in reality, relativity asserts that space possesses no inherent properties. This prompts a final inquiry. How does the concept of time evolve in this new framework? How are seconds, hours, and minutes impacted by the advent of relativity? New time. For the advanced society of the future, time held a multitude of meanings. They recognized the uniqueness of their own temporal existence, distinct from any others. Understanding that the passage of time varied based on location and activity, 
they harnessed the flexible nature of space-time to shape their civilization. The civilization utilized grand portals that manipulated time and space, enabling travel across their empire. Ingeniously, they even harnessed the gradual ticks near the gravitational pull of black holes to slow time, affording them the ability to witness the culmination of everything. A famous quote among them echoed the sentiment that for those who embraced physics, the conventional boundaries between past, present, and future were nothing more than a persistent illusion. The advent of Einstein's general relativity brought a new challenge to physicists, revealing that every particle in the universe had its own trajectory through the dimensions of space and time, a world line marked by the past, present, and future. Consider the particles within your own body. Each electron and quark follows its unique world line. In the early stages of existence, these world lines were scattered, but as you developed, they converged into a bundle that is uniquely you. When your time concludes, these world lines disperse once again. In the grand tapestry of the universe, your existence is but a fleeting moment, a temporary intertwining of world lines, a brief knot in the fabric of eternity. Although it may be a bit disconcerting, this concept seems to align logically. So, where does the confusion come in? To start, let's delve into the true meaning of the relativity of time. In the absence of absolute time, there's no universal cosmic clock leading to the absence of a singular present moment, an authentic now. Without a clear definition of a cosmic present, how do we pinpoint a distinct concept of the past? And without a defined present, where does the future commence? That's where the perplexity arises. According to the equations of relativity, all moments in the past, present, and future are already predetermined. The entire history of everything exists somewhere in the vast expanse of the universe. This idea, referred to as the block universe, has puzzled many physicists and philosophers. The absence of a definite now challenges the idea that the cosmos unfolds gradually from one moment to the next. As we trace our own life paths, we seem to follow a predetermined course. This raises questions about cherished concepts like free will. However, something doesn't quite add up. We vividly remember the past, and the future holds an air of mystery yet to unfold. They appear distinctly different, or do they? Consider two electrons racing towards each other. Both carry an identical negative charge, leading to mutual repulsion through electromagnetism. As they approach, this repulsion intensifies, causing their motion to gradually decelerate, come to a halt, and then reverse. Eventually, the electrons dart away from each other, retracing their previous path. Nothing appears unusual at first glance. We capture the interaction between two electrons on film and present it to a group of physicists. Now, imagine playing a mirrored version of the film where left is switched with right and vice versa. Surprisingly, the physicists would observe no abnormalities on the screen. The interchange of left and right has no impact on the physics displayed. On the screen, the electrons approach and repel each other, seemingly normal. Now, let's take it a step further. Instead of swapping left and right, what if we clumsily switched past and future, causing the film to run backward? Time has been reversed. The physicists watch intently. In this reversed movie, two electrons rapidly move towards each other, their repulsion growing as they get closer. Eventually, they come to a halt and begin moving away. To the audience's approval, everything seems ordinary in this reversed display of physics. But here's the puzzling aspect. Why is the electromagnetic interaction between electrons indifferent to the direction of time? It's not just electromagnetism. Gravity and the strong nuclear force exhibit the same unaffected behavior. The weak nuclear force does show a slight deviation, but it's a minuscule effect. This raises the intriguing question of why these fundamental forces operate independently of the arrow of time. At their core, the basic interactions of the universe on a microscopic level don't seem to have a preferred direction of time. It's as if time could go either way, and these interactions wouldn't mind. 
However, this poses a puzzling situation. The world we experience on a larger scale, with phenomena like cooling coffee, burning wood, and exploding supernovae, definitely has a sense of time. These processes aren't reversible. You can't undo the scrambling of an egg. Upon reflection, this seems a bit perplexing. Our everyday world is essentially the sum of countless atoms, all interacting through the fundamental force of electromagnetism. Interestingly, these electromagnetic interactions don't show any preference for the direction of time. The question arises, how does this apparent arrow of time emerge from the multitude of time agnostic interactions happening constantly? How does time come into play? Some argue for a definite arrow, a kind of imprint from a cosmological arrow of time. According to the straightforward perspective of the block universe, this arrow extends infinitely into both the past and the future. However, this block universe doesn't quite match the characteristics of our own reality. We're aware that our universe didn't exist infinitely in the past. It had a starting point. Based on observations, we know it came into existence nearly 14 billion years ago. While the exact process of its birth remains unknown, we do know that it emerged with both space and time. The origins of space and time within the universe continue to be a puzzling mystery. However, these fundamental elements have been essential components of the cosmos throughout its entire history. There are still unanswered questions surrounding the universe's birth, especially regarding its seemingly unique characteristics. It was intensely hot, dense, and remarkably smooth. This smoothness gives the newborn universe a distinctive quality. It began with very low entropy. It might sound counterintuitive that smoothness corresponds to low entropy. Think of it this way. Compare a gas evenly distributed throughout a room, higher entropy, to the same gas squeezed into one corner, lower entropy. In the vast expanse of the universe, its smooth structure allowed gravity to weave its magic, pulling matter together to form stars and galaxies. As the universe expands, the evolution of matter leads to an increase in entropy. The gravitational potential energy gradually transforms into celestial bodies like stars, planets, and even life forms such as ourselves. Over time, this energy is eventually converted into waste heat, dispersing throughout the cosmos. This transition from low to high entropy leaves an indelible mark on the universe, creating what we perceive as the arrow of time. Recently honored with the Nobel Prize, Sir Roger Penrose delved into the initial entropy of our universe. He determined that the likelihood of this occurrence by chance is an astonishing one in 10 to the 10 to the 123. Clearly, there is something extraordinary about the birth of our universe, although the specifics remain elusive. This raises the question, does the block universe lack an inherent arrow of time? Without the explosive event of the Big Bang, would distinguishing between the past and the future become impossible? Envisioning how we would experience such a universe proves to be a challenging task. Perhaps our very ability to imagine is rooted in the unique birth of the universe itself. On the 10th of June, 1944, a British Halifax bomber flew over France as part of a squadron of 400 bombers supporting the D-Day landings in Normandy. Unfortunately, near the city of Laval, the aircraft was hit by German flak and crashed in flames into the French countryside. Tragically, all members of the crew lost their lives in the crash, seven lives taken in the midst of a war that would eventually claim millions. The pilot, a 33-year-old Dutch volunteer named Willem Jacob van Stockham, may not be a household name today, but he holds a unique place in history as the man who laid the groundwork for time travel. While the concept of time travel was already a popular theme in science fiction by the 1940s, thanks to works like H.G. Wells' The Time Machine, it was considered mere fantasy and impossible in the framework of Newtonian space and time. However, within the emerging realm of relativity, Van Stockham discovered a scientific foundation for the idea. The mathematics of relativity is notoriously complex, and even Einstein himself questioned whether his field equations would have any analytical solutions. 
Astonishingly, just a year after presenting these equations to the world, the first such solution emerged. Schwarzschild, in his work, derived solutions that laid the groundwork for our understanding of black holes. In the 1920s, scientists embarked on a quest to uncover the mathematical essence of the entire universe. Visionaries like Einstein, Friedman, de Sitter, and others laid down principles, revealing a cosmos with expanding and possibly curved space, where parallel lines could converge and diverge. Amidst this exploration, some scientists delved into the mathematics of hypothetical universes. Hungarian mathematician Cornelius Lanxos stumbled upon a curious solution. His equations depicted a universe made of dust that rigidly rotated. Although this model didn't seem to mirror our own universe, it intrigued researchers. This led Van Stockham to ponder the trajectory of particles in such a rotating universe. As particles traversed from the past to the future, their paths wound around the universe. However, the rotation of the universe caused time and space to stretch and distort, blurring the nature of time itself. Some particle paths circled the universe and intersected with themselves, forming closed loops. In physics, these closed loop paths are termed time-like paths, but in simpler terms it hinted at nothing less than time travel. The revelation that space and time could be so warped as to permit time travel was astonishing. While a rotating universe might not be physically plausible, it prompted the exploration of whether there were alternative paths to the past or shortcuts to the future. Van Stockham had a dream of working closely with Einstein at Princeton, but with the ominous clouds of war gathering, he redirected his focus towards Europe. When his homeland fell under occupation, his aspirations shifted towards actively participating in the conflict. Unfortunately, Van Stockham's own journey came to an end in a French field on a dark night in 1944. Although Van Stockham's name may not be widely recognized in history, the concepts of time travel and rotating universes persisted. These ideas were resurrected by the eccentric mathematician Kurt Gödel in 1949. Gödel, renowned as one of the greatest logicians, is famous for his perplexing incompleteness theorem that continues to puzzle scholars today. Gödel's journey took a different turn compared to Van Stockham. Amidst the turmoil in Europe during World War II, Gödel successfully reached Princeton University. There, he developed a strong friendship with Einstein, who even supported Gödel's application for American citizenship. Einstein achieved this by skillfully diverting Gödel's attention away from pointing out flaws in the United States Constitution during the hearing. It was at Princeton that Gödel applied his remarkable mathematical mind to the study of relativity and the nature of space-time. In 1949, as a 70th birthday gift to Einstein, Gödel presented a solution to the field equations of relativity. Similar to von Stockham, he had uncovered the mathematical framework of a rotating universe, complete with closed time-like curves that intricately looped around his cosmic creation. Upon receiving the gift, Einstein, in his own words, expressed being disturbed by the potential implications. Interestingly, Gödel's wife had reportedly knitted him a sweater as well, but for some unknown reason, it didn't make it into the final gift. Unfortunately, Einstein passed away shortly thereafter in 1955, followed by Gödel in 1978. In his later years, Gödel, as an elderly individual, inquired with astronomers about whether they had confirmed the universe's rotation. The consistent response was always, no, it isn't, emphasizing that Gödel's universe differed from our own. Nevertheless, the notion that Einstein's relativity might permit time travel prompted researchers to revisit their equations. The fundamental question emerged. Could time and space truly contort back on themselves to such an extent as to enable temporal exploration? Physicists have persisted in uncovering mathematical shortcuts through the dimensions of space and time, leading to numerous solutions to Einstein's equations where space and time exhibit extreme warping. It appears that within the framework of Einstein's relativity, 
time travel stubbornly remains a theoretical possibility. When spin is added to a black hole, it causes space and time to twirl in tandem. If you were to venture through the center of this cosmic entity, there's a chance you might emerge in a completely different location and time. Another intriguing structure within the realm of relativity is a wormhole which acts like a space-time bridge connecting two points and potentially two different moments in time, though it doesn't necessarily guarantee a shortcut. The equations of relativity seem to contain the possibility of time travel, yet the practicality of these solutions and their existence remains a mystery. The challenge of concentrating enough energy in one place to bend space-time back onto itself raises uncertainties about the feasibility of these phenomena. While we have a grasp of how Einstein's space-time functions, the essence of what it truly is still eludes us. So, where do we go from here? The early 20th century marked a pivotal period in theoretical physics, with quantum mechanics leading the way in reshaping our understanding. Perhaps, physicists speculated, the key to unlocking more secrets lies at the smallest scales of the universe. Quantum Spacetime In the distant future, society found itself in a state of despair. The stars, once vibrant, had long extinguished and even matter itself began to undergo a disintegration process. Only a handful of individuals persisted, almost suspended in the shadows, witnessing the gradual cessation of life. Amidst this bleakness, a few gazes remained fixated on the dark expanse, yearning to witness the final bursts of light in the universe. Ancient texts had forewarned of this inevitable era, cautioning that not even the mighty black holes would endure indefinitely. While the powerful force of relativity had kept them bound together, the intricate dance of the quantum realm on a minuscule scale led to their ultimate decay. Throughout eons, efforts had been made to bridge the gap between these two seemingly disparate worlds, the realm of gravity and the enigmatic quantum domain. Yet, their black hole abode was now dissolving, and there was no remedy in sight. The remaining few were so weary that they didn't even attempt to intervene. In a different setting, a university student attending morning lectures on general relativity and afternoon classes on quantum mechanics might question the coherence of their professor's teachings. It would be easy for the student to assume that these academics had failed to communicate with each other for at least a century. Meanwhile, within the tranquil Roselawn Cemetery in Tallahassee, Florida, a grave holds the remains of a man who passed away in 1984 at the age of 82. What sets him apart from the others in the graveyard is a plaque at Westminster Abbey, not far from Isaac Newton's resting place. The plaque provides minimal information, identifying the man as a physicist and stating his birth and death dates. Yet, it also features an equation, a complex amalgamation of Latin and Greek letters. Remarkably, this equation represents the groundbreaking achievement of unifying Einstein's relativity and quantum mechanics for the first time. Niels Bohr, the renowned physicist, once described Paul Adrien Maurice Dirac as the most peculiar individual to grace his institute. Born in Bristol at the turn of the 20th century, Dirac didn't initially appear destined for scientific greatness. In 1923, he embarked on his academic journey at the University of Cambridge. Renowned for his unwavering focus on science, Dirac avoided many social interactions and his conversations were notably sparse. His colleagues playfully coined the term Dirac to describe the pace of one word per hour in his honor. Despite his slow speech, Dirac's mind raced through the complexities of physics during a time when both Einstein's relativity and the intriguing facets of quantum mechanics were unfolding. Were the universe's fundamental secrets finally unraveling? As Dirac delved into quantum mechanics, he found himself grappling with outdated perspectives. The mathematics of Schrodinger and Heisenberg unfolded against the backdrop of Newton, with an absolute clock ticking and space envisioned through Galileo's eyes. Dirac sensed that quantum mechanics equations should align with Einstein's revolutionary ideas about space and time. This realization troubled him, 
leading to countless hours spent walking alone on Sundays, wrestling with the mathematical intricacies in his mind. Then, in December 1927, the fog began to lift, revealing a relativistic quantum equation. This equation adhered to Einstein's insistence that there is no privileged rest frame in the universe. Dirac employed this equation to elucidate the behavior of the electron, solving various puzzling aspects, such as its magnetic properties, as natural consequences of relativity. However, one unexpected revelation emerged. Just as the square root of one has two solutions, plus one or minus one, the Dirac equation had two solutions when describing the electron. While one solution clearly represented the negatively charged electron, the positive solution puzzled Dirac. Could it be the proton, the positively charged particle within the nucleus? The vast difference in mass quickly ruled out that possibility. Dirac eventually concluded that his equation predicted a new particle, the anti-electron. This hypothetical particle would mirror the electron's mass, but possess a positive charge, introducing the concept of antimatter. The Dirac equation marked the beginning of quantum field theory, which stands as the most successful physical theory to date. This mathematical framework allows us to describe all fundamental particles and forces, forming the basis of the modern standard model. Each particle, such as electrons, positrons, quarks, and antiquarks, has its counterpart, a consequence of Einstein's perspective on relative space and time. However, it's important to note that quantum field theory is founded on Einstein's special theory of relativity, leaving the general theory of relativity, which deals with gravity, in the background. The question arises, what if we integrate curved space-time into the Dirac equation? Despite the initial triumphs, the last century has not seen significant progress in this pursuit. In quantum field theory, the quantum wave function, fundamental to existence, unfolds within the framework of space and time. While special relativity has added complexity to Newton's understanding, the universal stage still revolves around space and time. This breaks down when we consider the curved space-time introduced by general relativity. In this theory, space and time become dynamic and evolving players in the physics of the universe. Quantum mechanics was already intricate, but after years of effort, its various infinities were eventually controlled. However, when space-time starts curving and rippling, these infinities become seemingly uncontrollable. Faced with the challenge of merging gravity and quantum mechanics, some physicists have explored alternative avenues. This involves revisiting the foundations, proposing new concepts of space and time in the pursuit of the elusive theory of everything, an attempt to connect the microscopic quantum realm with the macroscopic world of general relativity and provide a comprehensive explanation of the universe. These theories of everything, like string or M-theory, don't necessarily simplify matters. In one prominent contender, string or M-theory, there might be 11 or even 26 dimensions. The question remains, what insights do these ideas offer regarding the fundamental nature of space and time? Once again, it's not as straightforward as it seems. In the realm of M-theory, Space and time are integral components of the universe's fundamental structures. The peculiar, twisted shape of these structures, existing in multiple dimensions, provides an explanation for everything, not just space and time, but also encompassing all matter, radiation, and forces. However, M-theory falls short when it comes to revealing the composition of these fundamental structures. Another contender for the elusive theory of everything is loop quantum gravity, and on the surface it appears even more perplexing. Here, space and time are envisioned as quantum phenomena. At the incredibly minuscule Planck scale, space-time takes on a chunky, meshed form, intricately woven into a network. Strangely, this subatomic mesh appears to us as smooth space and time. Once again, the question arises, what makes up these quantum grains? Unfortunately, we're left without an answer, as they seemingly just are. However, some thinkers speculate that the solution may be simpler than these complex theories suggest. What if space and time don't actually exist? Recall the early disagreement between Newton and Leibniz. 
Newton believed space and time were intrinsic realities, independent of the universe's matter. In contrast, Leibniz argued that the relationships among matter defined space and time. Without them, these concepts would be meaningless. Einstein's relativistic view of space-time aligns with Leibniz's perspective. According to Einstein, matter shapes the structure of space-time, and in turn, space-time dictates the behavior of matter. In the quantum realm, space-time seems to have a lumpy nature, and the universe may be constructed from these bits of space-time as it expands. Yet, what if space and time are not actual entities? What if they are emergent phenomena, only experienced by us as macroscopic beings? It might seem a bit unusual, but consider this. We're essentially sandwiched in the vast expanse of the universe. This positioning shields us from feeling the cosmic expansion that governs the universe on a grand scale. Similarly, we don't sense individual atoms colliding with our skin. Instead, we collectively perceive this interaction as temperature. Could it be that space and time share a similar relationship? In 1997, Juan Maldashena stumbled upon a crucial link in the realms of string theory and gravity, known as the Adia CFT correspondence. While it might be a mere coincidence with no profound implications, it could also be pointing towards something more profound, the potential fusion of quantum mechanics and gravity. If this hypothesis holds true, it introduces an intriguing concept. The connection between space and time becomes granular, consisting of fundamental lengths and times, Planck scale pixels defining the universe's smallest resolution. At these minuscule scales, space and time might resemble nothing more than grains of sand on a beach. Perhaps there's no space between these reality grains and no discernible time from one grain to the next. To these fundamental bits, the concepts of space and time might be irrelevant. Only their relationships and interactions matter. For us, existing on a much larger scale than these granular bits, the notion of space prevails. Somehow, through the intricate relationships among these grains, we get to experience our reality. Yet, at a fundamental level, it raises the question, do space and time truly exist? Or are they merely compositions of fundamental bits and pieces and their interconnections? This idea may feel unsettling. Where does the essence of you fit into this relational universe? Perhaps it's akin to accepting the fact that we're physically composed of atoms. Somewhere within this amalgamation, our consciousness emerges, and we've learned to live with this illusion of our being. Maybe all we need to do is extend this acceptance to the stage upon which we play out our existence. And thus, we've traversed a considerable distance and find ourselves nearing the culmination of our expedition. Throughout our journey, space and time, once seemingly ordinary and natural, have unveiled their inherent strangeness and mystery. While Newton's understanding rendered them as straightforward and absolute, Einstein's introduction of curved space-time added complexity. The quantum nature of space-time further attempted to fragment them into minute components. Yet, are we any closer to unraveling their true essence? Much anticipation rests upon our forthcoming fundamental theories, aspiring that a comprehensive theory will illuminate the universal stage, shedding light on the genuine nature of space and time. The possibility exists that the block universe may dissipate as the universe unfolds, or perhaps quantum processes are intricately constructing a continuous now. It's also plausible that an as-yet unimagined process is shaping our reality. Nevertheless, nature isn't obligated to disclose its secrets, and despite scientists' relentless efforts, the fundamental truth may remain elusive. We must confront the reality that certain enigmas could persist indefinitely. What space and time truly entail might forever elude our understanding. In the final chapter, we return to the twilight of the cosmos. In their cosmic abode, the last inhabitants witness the gradual evaporation of their black hole. Their sole desire is to extend their existence for just one more day, one more moment. Yet, the inevitable decay of the universe eventually becomes undeniable. Despite manipulating space and mastering time, bending them to their will, they prove powerless against their ultimate forces. As darkness descends, 
Their once manipulated cosmos succumbs to the inevitable, 